Welcome to Half Hour of Heterodoxy, featuring conversations with scholars and authors and ideas from diverse perspectives. Here's your host, Chris Martin. James Poniewozik is my guest today. He's the chief television critic for The New York Times. We'll be talking about his new book, Audience of One, Donald Trump, Television, and the Fracturing of America, which was listed as one of the 10 best books of the year by Publishers Weekly, one of the 50 notable works of nonfiction in 2019 by The Washington Post, and a notable book of the year by The New York Times Book Review. One critic called it two books in one because half the book examines the history of television from the Reagan era to today, and the other half illustrates how Donald Trump assiduously used television to create his persona. As Poniewozik puts it, Trump is, quote, a character that wrote itself, a brand mascot that jumped off the cereal box and entered the world, a simulacrum that replaced the thing it represented. Audience of One combines both humor and serious analysis to explain how new forms of television programming, reality TV in particular, have changed the world that we live in. Hi, James. Thanks for joining us on the show. Well, thanks a lot, Chris. Uh, I'd like to start by talking about television in general. So if you were to give a talk to college students today to prepare them for how television has been influencing culture and how it's going to continue influencing culture and politics, what would you say to them? Um, You know, I think the first thing that I would do is sort of impress on them what is one of the underpinnings of my book, which is that the, the form of television and of any medium often influences the content and uh, the, 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 the way that the kind of content that it produces, the tone and tenor of that content. Uh, so the first thing that I would probably talk to them about is about how Obviously, television has mattered, for instance, in politics, in American politics for a long time, you know, going back to the Kennedy-Nixon debates and so on, if those students had studied that or not, you know, uh, through, you know, Reagan, Clinton, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but what, what, what does that really mean? One of the things that that means is that television tends to promote a different kind of argument and rhetoric than, you know, print media does, right? You're, you're sending image uh, as well as text. Uh, so it is much more ripe for sort of appeals to emotion and the non-literal. I'd probably talk to them a bit about uh, Neil Postman's Amusing Ourselves to Death, uh, which was, you know, one of the sort of, uh, you know, I wouldn't say necessarily inspirations, but jumping off points for this book where he talked about uh, sort of following in the footsteps of people like Marshall McLuhan, how television sends a different sort of communication than, than text. And one, one great quote from his was, one can disagree with a television commercial, but one can't refute it, which is to say the logic that you tend to get or, or the kind of argument and rhetoric that you get in a visual medium uh, tends to be as much about emotion and non-literal feelings than it is uh, about logic. Um, so that's, that's, that's sort of a baseline, you know, and, 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 and then, you know, part of the question is, okay, so when that television environment that we live in, right, because part of the reason this is so important is that in a mediated society, in, in, a, in a society where we're spending, you know, six or eight hours of our day or more in front of some screen or another, more and more of our experience of the world comes to us through a screen. So what is it that we're getting from those screens and how has that changed over time? And one thing that I would need to lay out for them, and I won't give it to you in all the detail, although we can go into more of it later. Uh, but, you know, a lot of young people don't really realize, you know, or, or they didn't grow up during the sort of mass media era of television when we had three networks you know, when everything was sort of directed toward and helped to create a monoculture where people were watching the same things at the same time, hearing the same ideas at the same time, and everyone from entertainers to political presenters on TV had to assume the same sort of broad audience. And that changes the communication a lot when you move from that to our, you know, fragmented thousand channel 
you know, million social media feed environment that, that, that we have now. Describing it to you, I realized that I would probably have to tighten that talk a lot for these students. <laughs> but 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 that's that's sort of the you know. In other words, before you can you can talk about the you know in in what ways you know what kinds of messages television is sending us, you kind of have to understand something about just just how it sends the message and why that matters. So I would like to get into the fracturing of America that you just talked about, or the fracturing of the television audiences. That's one of the subtitles in your book title. But um, you talk about both the history of TV and how Donald Trump has used television and the economy of celebrity in general. Um, were you or would you have written this book even if Donald Trump hadn't existed? Were you interested in writing a book about the history of TV or was it really the way in which Trump used TV that fascinated you? You know what? I, I could have, but I'm not sure I would have. And, and here's the reason. It's, it's funny. That I'm not sure anybody has asked me about this, but it's something that I've thought about a lot. All the principles that I'm talking about in this book would have existed, you know, regardless. Uh, the, the way that, you know, um, the fragmentation of media has fragmented the culture in many ways, uh, the way that that creates both you know, a more sort of rich and diverse type of television art and often a more polarized and fractious, you know, TV news culture and so on. And, you know, even if Donald Trump never existed or never ran for president, you could see the evidence for that in, you know, the political battles of the cable news era, it's, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know if I'd have been able to sell that book very well, number one. And I don't know if it would have been as engaging to write for the reason that that would have been a very sort of, uh, you know, dry kind of idea based book. Uh, that you know, you could have written it as a, as a, a history of television. You could have written it as you know a book that's sort of organized with you know chapters around themes. But what happens when Donald Trump, you know, the guy from The Apprentice, is suddenly elected president? It is two things. Number one, it is a dramatic manifestation that this stuff actually matters. Like <laughs> there is there is to me, you know, and and I still. To have a hard time persuading some people of this, but but uh, there is to me no better proof that television is still an extremely powerful influencer of politics and the larger culture than directly electing the host of a primetime reality show president without any intervening, you know, step, you know, term spent as governor of a state or anything like that. So you know, this right. is, this is you know, this is literal proof like this stuff can affect the political climate of the country and the world. And number two, uh, you know, again, all this stuff would have been true if, you know, Marco Rubio were president today or Hillary Clinton or, 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 or whoever. But once you have this fact that everybody's grappling with of Donald Trump being president and this sort of, you know, tumultuous event happening in American politics. And how did, how did we get there? Suddenly this, this dry kind of, you know, academic ideas story becomes a story with a narrative and a through line and a protagonist, you know, as a critic, that's uh, something that you almost never have a, a, a chance to do is to write something that is basically a narrative work following, you know, a, a, a fascinating, surreal, uh, maybe terrifying character over the the arc of a period of, of generational and societal change. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I had thought about writing books, you know, on and off for, you know, the couple of decades that I've been a TV critic, and I'd never been able to come up with a subject that I just thought engage my attention enough to spend the couple of years that it, that, that it takes doing that. I think, I think the fact that this, you know, gave me the chance to sort of really write a story rather than just an argument uh, was uh, appealing and to me at least more powerful. And the way you frame your book, you mentioned two appearances by Donald Trump on TV, one from 19, 1981, where he argues that he's not the kind of person who would be elected president because you need to have a certain agreeableness and popularity. And then in 2015, just before he does run, he appears on TV 
and says that uh, you don't have to be generally liked anymore. And so you frame your book by saying um, he was right both times and we need to understand the changes that occurred. So if you cover several changes, the rise of the anti-hero drama, professional wrestling, reality shows, uh, if you were to pick one of those as the most important for understanding politics, I know that's a tough question, but if there's one that's the most crucial development, would you? Pick, which one would you pick? I mean, actually, it's probably not a super tough question because I've I've, I've, I've thought about this a lot, and you know, I, in reality, you can't separate any of these out from Donald Trump because he kind of required a perfect storm of confluence of events to actually end up in the White House, um, but. You know, I certainly think when you're talking about presidential politics, you know, cable news and the rise of Fox News in particular is the, you know, biggest, uh, you know, sin qua non. You know, it's, it's, it's just it, with without without the ways that it modeled for an audience, this idea that the act of politics, the act of governance was this sort of theatrical culture war fighting, you know, because they'd seen it on TV and 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 in their political media for a couple of decades, there wouldn't be the opportunity for Donald Trump or anyone else to take that that next step and go from simply being you know a an outspoken controversial celebrity figure to someone with an actual political following and political authority. So if I got to pick one, it's that. But in reality. You know, all of these these changes of fragmented media are, are are associated, and it's a lot of one thing leading to this, leading to that. And you talk in the latter half of your book about a psychological study showing that we form parasocial bonds with our TV characters or with the TV characters we watch. So they we feel like we're acquainted with them. We feel like uh, we know them the way we know our friends. Um, but you also talk about how we. Well, that study suggests we even form parasocial bonds with people who are narcissistic or not entirely virtuous. Um, with anti-heroes, for example, I, a lot of people felt like they knew Walter White and Breaking Bad. Yeah. So why do you think, I know you're not a, a psychologist, but psychologically, why do you think people form these bonds with people who are not virtuous? Yeah, I mean, uh, look, yeah, it, it's, it, it is important to stress that I am entirely a, a, a psychological dilettante here so i don't want to i don't i don't want to be claim you know i don't, I don't want to claim otherwise but you know uh, first there's the i don't know if you would call it you know the uh, the evolutionary fact or or the psych psychological fact that um we we create these bonds with figures that we encounter through mediated channels because our brains haven't evolved to distinguish between contexts that we make in reality in the flesh and contacts that we get from somebody simply being in our living room once a week and becoming a familiar face that we see as often as we see many other you know people in in, in our real life, uh, you know, and then and then further to that, um, I think that you know a viewer makes an identification, you know, for instance, with an antihero or villain like Walter White, uh, in part because. You know, those are sort of the imperatives of story, you know, to continue watching. You need to be invested in his challenges and the way he gets around them and the conflicts. Uh, you know, you need to be engaged by how well the story is told and therefore you want the story to continue. And that on some level, uh, you want him to win out. And of course, you know, you're a good person. I'm a good person. We all want to think of ourselves as, as good people. So... You need to, you know, get yourself to a place where you realize that that identification is not a bad thing. And for some people, that is, you know, sort of accepting that, okay, well, um, one can be engaged in a, with a story, but not approve of the character's behavior, you know, not think that that's an actual model for behavior in real life. But for other people, and you, you definitely saw this with Walter White, it becomes, well, that behavior must be good or it must be defensible. Uh, you, you know, Walter White is really just a, a, a strong man who's providing for his family and he's, 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 he's taking care of his own in a tough world. And there's nothing wrong with it. And, you know, I, I don't want to say that, like, 
Breaking Bad simply brainwashed people into believing this. There's always a push pull with it, right? Like if you if you if you are inclined to believe that sort of message, you are probably at least bringing some of that, if not all of it, you know, with you to begin with. Um, but it certainly gives you a lot of material to buttress that point of view if it's one that you're inclined to. Right. You know that 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 say you know. It's 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 a tough world, and maybe you know conventional morality doesn't apply anymore, or that what matters is that you take care of the people who are close to you, and you know screw everybody else. Right. I mean, I do think it's interesting that after Breaking Bad, the the first major TV role, if I've got this right, the first major TV role that Brian Cranston had was as was playing Lyndon B. Johnson, a U.S. president, in in All the Way. Yeah, he's done a few others, but that may have been his next big role after that immediately. But yeah, I mean, it's, you know, there is, you know, I think quite a connection between anti-hero charisma and political charisma. They just, they draw on this, a lot of the same types of performance. I mean, anti, you know, obviously there are a lot of different kinds of anti-heroes in, in drama generally and, and on TV, but particularly with these male anti-heroes that you could see in some ways as, you know, uh, paving the way for the political persona that Donald Trump ran on. Um, there are these common elements of sort of dominance behavior, uh, which certainly was, you know, is a thing with politicians generally and Lyndon Johnson in particular. Right. Uh, and it is sort of interesting to see how the same figure conveys those two things in, in, you know, uh, in, in different environments. Right. You know, I mean, Lyndon Johnson was, you know, very famously someone who would, you know, uh, uh, loom over people. Yeah. 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 He, he, like he physically loomed the way right. that a, a Tony Soprano did, a very big guy who liked to use that and, you know, make just sort of the, his, his prominence and his masculinity felt. Uh, you know, he had his own ways of saying, I'm the one who knocks. <laughs> and and right. that's that, you know, yeah. That, so that's, that's definitely not an, not an unrelated thing. Right. So I'm curious about whether you think this economy of celebrity is influencing young people. The reason I ask this is I did part of my dissertation on why young people appear to be more anxious, college students in particular. Um, and one counseling center administrator, college counseling center administrator whom I interviewed said, this is a quote from her, and this interview was done in November 2016. Uh, she said, my observation just of social culture over the past number of years is that we have created this economy of celebrity that I think is problematic for young people. People who don't have a degree and are not espousing a particular occupation become famous. They have become successful and famous and in many cases wealthy simply by being and being seen. And I think that's what many of our students are competing against. And I think one of the disadvantages of this most recent political outcome is that we have, in fact, reinforced the idea that you don't actually have to be skilled and have any particular expertise in order to be highly successful. So do you feel like that sort of economy of celebrity is is stressing out young people because it, it suggests that expertise is overrated? Um. I kind of don't want to speak for young people in that way <laughs> from the standpoint yeah. of whether it is, it is stressing them out. Um, I will, you know, I'm glad to take somebody else's uh, uh, word for that, but I do think it is, it, it's undeniably a much bigger presence and reality in their lives. You know, if you are a young person today, as opposed to, you know, when I was in college or, you know, certainly when, when Donald Trump was just leaving college and getting into business, um, there, you know, there was a, there was a celebrity culture, but, you know, you, you couldn't, you couldn't look to, uh, you know, say, you know, uh, teenagers getting incredibly famous, you know, simply as, as YouTubers, you know, that, that, that sort of thing. Uh, in other words, people sort of self-generating, fame and careers simply from accessibility on the media. Uh, you know, I would think that like a lot of technological revolutions, it probably creates both a sense of opportunity and anxiety, right? Because there are, there are people for whom doors are opened and uh, many other people for whom there's just a sense that there are doors out there that they don't know how to get through. And that is a, that's a, that's a stressful experience. 
Um, but you know, it, it is certainly, you know, just just a, a you know, in, in, in connection with the the experience of of Donald Trump as a celebrity that I'm laying out here, it's it's certainly multiplying at many levels of scale and many many times over the thing that was his initial insight when he goes into his dad's real estate business and he says, I'm going to bring show business into real estate, uh, which is that, you know, appearance can create reality and that it is more important to seem like the best X, Y, Z than it is actually to be the best X, Y, Z because you can leverage that appearance into a brand and into, uh, other efforts. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and, and and then the brand sort of becomes the business in itself. So you know, the very you know the 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 one point version of that <laughs> is you become a, a tabloid star, and then you know a presence on on talk shows, and you write a book, and you know you 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 become sort of famous for being famous in that way. Uh, but now that has you know that that's that's. Uh, that has trickled down to everybody from reality stars to people who become social media stars and Instagram influencers without even the intermediating authority of, you know, reality TV producer. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, th I, th I think it definitely resonates, you know, to what extent it's a, a positive or negative for the young people of today. I'd be interested to hear from them. Right. I mean, I don't know if anyone has has done a systematic study of young people on this yeah. issue. It does seem like it's um, it's weird that we aren't tired of narcissists because eventually, I mean, in the real world, we eventually get tired of the narcissists that we have to deal with. But um, when they're on Instagram or YouTube, somehow we we don't get as tired of we don't get tired so easily. But um, I wanted to talk about your recent coverage of of other political things. You, so you've written a, quite a few columns about the impeachment hearings, which were on TV yeah. and had a huge TV audience, and also the debates. So among um, people in Congress and people running for president in 2020, do you feel like any candidates or any politicians um, understand how to use TV the way Donald Trump did? Um. Well, not necessarily the way Donald Trump did, but I'm not sure that using TV the way that Donald Trump did would work in the Democratic Party. Uh, you know, I, I think that at best what you want to do is to offer a competing theory or a competing narrative um, and an answer to the question of how to get your message into a media that's that's dominated – by this outrageous president that dovetails with the uh, you know with, with with the particular realities of your party, and, and what I, what I, what I mean by that is that you know just like with a, with a lot of political things there you know there are differences between Republicans and Democrats and their their audiences you know the Republican Party is you know in America tends to be more racially and culturally homogeneous. Uh, the Democratic Party tends to be more of a confederation. And so it tends to be different kinds of messages that get across well in a different kind of communication. I mean, you know, that, that's, I, you know, that's why I think, you know, uh, you had, for instance, the, the boomlet in speculation a while ago about whether somebody like Oprah Winfrey might run for the Democratic nomination, right? Right. Like, she is a celebrity. She's a media celebrity, somebody who uses media very well. She doesn't use it precisely in the way that that Donald Trump does, although there are some parallels. But she is, you know, has a persona that is, you know, sort of, uh, that that is more in keeping with kind of not just the ideology, but like the aesthetic of the the, the Democratic Party. So you could see somebody using it uh in that way uh you know i don't think that there's necessarily a democrat this time out who i think just has like you know a, a magic media touch the way that you know say barack obama seemed to for his moment in 2008 what i do see is kind of a lot of competing theories of the case uh somebody like you know mayor pete you know pete Buttigieg, um is someone who I, I believe even wrote academically on 
political messaging and television and the media and, you know, talks a lot sort of uh, explicitly about how we have to, you know, find ways of changing the channel from, you know, this, this, this show that, you know, Donald Trump produces. Uh, conversely, somebody like Joe Biden is sort of making the argument that you can appeal to people's sense of exhaustion and, you know, offer them an opportunity to turn the channel off. Uh, you know, Bernie Sanders, on the other hand, is, you know, somebody who sort of has a, 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 a he, he runs on a deep sense of having a brand of personal authenticity and kind of a pugilistic communication style. And, you know, probably sort of uh, just uh, rhetorically is probably the, the closest to Trump. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think like, you know, he, he would, he would necessarily take that as a compliment, but I mean, you know, just simply in the sense, in the sense of kind of having, you know, a punchy debate style and, and, and so on that, uh, uh, that sort of thing. All of these are, you know, kind of things that are suited to that particular person. And I don't necessarily know what works better, but I do think that like, when you look at the democratic debates, I at least look at it in part as a meta argument of, you know, here is how I would use the media. Here's how I would use my media presence uh, against this sort of media typhoon that we're up against. Right. Well, with Bernie Sanders, I think what's similar is there's a sense that his, his speeches aren't crafted by a PR team or by a group yeah. of several people um, trying to craft the least objectionable message um, in this overly polished way. So there's that similarity. Um Actually, that reminds me of there's a, there's a chapter in your book about the least objectionable, but the, the concept of the least objectionable program. Uh, can you talk a bit about that and whether that is still around to some degree? Um, so the least objectionable program was a, a TV programming term that emerged in the I guess, early 70s, late 60s, uh, that described the notion of, in a, in a three-network TV environment, when all the networks had to draw, you know, audiences of tens of millions in order to survive. You needed to put things on the air that were inoffensive. That, in other words, the goal of, you know, your typical TV program was not to give people a reason to change the channel, right? You know, this was a time when you didn't have a lot of different media options, TVs, you know, generally didn't even have remotes. You actually had to physically get up from your couch and walk across the room to change that channel. And so you didn't want people crossing that defensive moat. And so you put things on that were sort of, you know, big tent and appealed to everybody and kind of, you know, tried to offend nobody. Um, and the incentives become different once uh, media becomes more multiplicitous. The, once you have more choices and more of those choices are targeted at particular types of audiences, particular demographics, particular interests, you are creating programming that is explicitly not for everybody that, you know, and then in many cases is, you know, I mean, a, a lot of, you know, the, the from the early days of MTV, uh, you know, a lot of the imperative of that, like a lot of youth programming is this is totally not for your parents. This would, you know, annoy your parents. Right. And, and, right. and that's replicated in all sorts of fields throughout the media. You move from trying to create the least objectionable program to, in many ways, trying to create the most objectionable program. Uh, thing, things that are really not for a lot of people, but are intensely for the group that they're aimed at. Uh, and, you know, that, that kind of gets to that evolution that I am trying to sketch out in the journey of Donald Trump as essentially a, a TV persona that you were alluding to, that, you know, when he said in 19, you know, 1981 that a controversial figure can't get elected president today because of, of television, and when he said in 2015 that, oh, I don't think this is going to be election really about likability, he's right both times. What has changed is, is the environment that changed in ways that were very fortuitous and, and lucky for him. Uh, so so the, the LOP, the least objectionable program, is something that it is more and more missing in the you know popular media and entertainment culture today. Uh, you know, the sort of the closest ex examples that you'll see to it is say something like the Super Bowl, one of the, f you know, uh, the few remaining mass events 
where, you know, you are trying to offer a halftime show for people who don't like football and, you know, this kind of, you know, and this angle to pull in this group and, you know, because it's, you're literally aiming it at all of America. Um, one thing that is sort of interesting that I try to, you know, dig into a, a bit in the book is, is that one place where you still sort of have that dynamic is in a presidential general election, right? Where, where you sort of have a kind of a two network system constitutionally built into the system. In other words, you have to obtain an electoral college majority and for all practical purposes, only two political parties have a shot at it. And, and, and so, you know, theoretically, you are trying to appeal to, well, you don't necessarily need 50% of the electorate, but you need 50% of the electoral votes. Um, so that's where you, you, you know, have lately been getting this dissonance between a media culture and a political media culture that's often very tailored to intense political bases. And then, you know, this, this atmosphere of national politics where politicians, at least until recently had to, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, adopt at least the pretense of speaking to everyone and wanting to govern, govern everyone. Right. Yeah. There's this uh, former speechwriter named Barton Swain, who has a book about his work speechwriting for Mark Sanford in South Carolina. But um, I heard him at a book festival and he talked about how the one unique thing about Donald Trump's strategy and in, in around 2016 was being very clear that there are certain segments of the public he was not trying to appeal to, um, which up to then was less common. The reason I brought up whether the least objectionable program is coming back, it just seems like everyone is talking about baby Yoda. And it does seem like, I mean, who doesn't like a baby? So yeah, baby Yoda is sort of this way of appealing to everyone. Uh, I mean, you, you, you tend to see it more. I mean, that's, that's actually not a bad point. Um, you know, the thing is, the the Mandalorian itself, I don't know if that is necessarily, you know, the same sort of like broad big tent programming that, uh, you know, you saw back in the 50s and 60s, although it kind of is. But mm -hmm. more and more often, when you see that kind of, you know, mass phenomena still exist, but A, they're, they're more the exception than the rule in our culture. And it tends to be more in, you know, sort of memes and things that people are, you know, uh, 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 consuming kind of atmospherically or, you know, secondhand through, you know, you might, you know, think ma Baby Yoda is really cute and, you know, see Baby Yoda, you know, GIFs online and, and, uh, mm. you know, uh, and, and that sort of thing. And yet never have watched an episode of the Mandalorian. You know, there's, there's this kind of like separate viral life that that phenomenon has, you know, you see it in, you know, something like, uh, old town road, you know, the, the, this past summer is kind of, uh, an, an old fashioned example of a, you know, several quadrants musical hit that, you know, it's hip hop and it's country and it's, you know, for young people and it's got stuff that, that appeals to old people. And yet it emerges, you know, basically from, from TikTok, like this extremely micro media outlet. It wasn't, you know, it, you know, it, 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 it wasn't produced for, you know, consumption on the Ed Sullivan show or something like that. Like, you right. know, it, it was, it was out of, out of this, uh, sort of, you know, atmosphere of multiplicity and millions of voices, one thing came up that this vast sort of mass social media audience found that it could connect to in one way or another. So, you know, so those those mass phenomena do still exist, but the mechanics of them are a lot different now. And, and, and again, yeah, I, I, I just think that, you know, they tend to be the exception in the same way that, you know, an interesting niche TV program was the exception in the 1960s. Oh, well, which of the TV shows that are running right now do you really enjoy? Um, I really, I'm going to cheat a little bit because you know, with with streaming and so on, uh, no, nothing nothing really dies, and we're, <laughs> we're we're in the holidays, so we're sort of uh, between seasons. But one show that I just finished that I really loved is. Uh, uh, HBO's reconception of Watchmen. 
uh, which I would recommend to anybody. I've written about it a fair amount as a critic because I find it fascinating. It is in an era of a lot of sort of cheap, boring cultural nostalgia and reboots and remakes. It was something I was very anxious about, you know, because it is a a reboot of a comic series, graphic novel that was already made into a movie. And it was another thing based on existing intellectual property. And I'm kind of you know tired of that. But Damon Lindelof and his writing staff uh, did this fascinating thing where they took this sort of subversive comic story that was about the Cold War, brought it to the present and recontextualized it and made it rather than about the Cold War, about America's racial history and the history of lynching in America and using race to, you know, question the idea of, you know, who is it in America that really needs to wear masks and be protective of their identities? You know, maybe it's not Clark Kent, (laughs) you know, maybe it is, you know, maybe, maybe it is, you know, uh, you know, a black man who is, you know, not going to be received as a hero if people know who it is, you know, behind the mask. Uh, So it's in addition to being incredibly entertaining, uh, which is the only way that something like this can work. uh, It had fantastic ideas. And it's nine episodes. Uh, You know, I I kind of appreciate a short, discreet, uh, (laughs) you know, work work of TV these days. So if you haven't watched it, I I totally recommend that. It just it works on every level. I I do appreciate short, discreet series. I I don't like it when around season three, it starts to become a soap opera that just seems to go on forever. In the era of streaming, there are just so many bloated TV shows, you know, and this this felt just right. It could have even been a couple of episodes longer. And, you know, it's, it's kind of rare for something to leave you wanting more these days. Well, James, thanks for joining us on the show. It was great having you. Oh, thanks, Chris. That was a really good talk. You can follow James on Twitter at Ponywazik. That's spelled P-O-N-I-E-W-O-Z-I-K. He's speaking at a few universities in 2020, so he may also be at your university in the near future. The show notes include a link to an episode of the Bulwark podcast where Charlie Sykes talks to James Ponowazik about the book and to a couple of video recordings of some longer book talks. If you enjoyed listening to the show, please leave us a review on iTunes because it helps spread the word about the show. And as always, you can reach me at podcast at heterodoxacademy.org and follow me on Twitter at chrismartin76. Thanks for listening. This podcast is produced by Heterodox Academy. Find us online at heterodoxacademy.org, on Twitter at HDX Academy, and on Facebook.